Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode of the Osasu Show. As most of you are aware, on September 9th, 2020, the Osasu Show Symposium held its fourth edition. We had erudite professor Patrick P. L. O. Lumumba speak all the way from Kenya. We had former presidents Goodluck Jonathan and Joyce Banda of Malawi, as well as the president of Africa in Bank, the president of One Campaign, and a host of other dignitaries that participated in the theme Rethinking Africa. What does this mean and how do we continue this conversation post symposium? On today's episode, we'll be discussing some key thematic areas regarding rethinking Africa and ways we can continue to harness human capital development across the African continent. We'll have a recap of my speech as well as the first keynote speaker, Professor Kingsley Morelu, who participated all the way from Washington, DC. Excepts from these speeches will form a communique which, which we'll use on their TOS TV network, which most of you already know is a Pan-African television network that reports news from Africa by Africans to the rest of the world. We will use excepts of our speeches and keynote addresses to come up with a development plan that will impact the lives of everyday Africans, as well as policy makers to shape perspective on how we can rethink Africa and move this continent forward. Don't go anywhere, it promises to be a very intellectually engaging episode. Amidst the incredible, difficult and coronavirus pandemic circumstances, the Osasu Show Symposium held its fourth edition with a theme, Rethinking Africa, pulling together a collection of inspiring and prominent though leaders in the continent. Reviews from participants of the Osasu Show Symposium all across Africa show that the discourse was not just timely but impactful in the journey to actualizing a truly prosperous Africa for all. Delivering her opening remarks, the CEO of TOS TV Network and Executive Director of the Osasu Show Foundation highlighted the timeliness of the conversation given the lessons of the pandemic has taught us and the need to reposition Africa as the new investment destination of choice for the global economy. It's an honor to address you at the fourth edition of the Osasu Show Symposium. The world, as we all know, was taken aback by the global pandemic that struck most nations earlier this year. Words are not enough to describe the havoc caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially to families who lost loved ones. My prayer is that the Almighty God will comfort the bereaved and give those of us whose lives were spared a rethink to how we operate not only in business, but purposefully across board. The theme of this year's symposium is Rethinking Africa. This conversation is timely, giving the lessons the pandemic has taught us regarding the need to be self-sufficient. We can no longer afford to rely wholly on a single commodity or worse off, foreign aid. We saw how each nation and union began hauling for themselves personal protective equipments, ventilators and medication at the initial stages of the pandemic. Most powerful nations bought up majority of life-saving supplies, leaving the poorer nations scrambling for peanuts. As Africans, it became clear that we have no one to rely on but ourselves. Not our international development partners, not our major trade partners, just us, Africans. It has therefore become imperative to devise homegrown solutions to the plethora of issues plaguing Africa. 
As a matter of urgency, we must rethink our policies, our politics, and the way we do business. Intra-Africa trade remains at an abysmally low 18% compared to intra-European trade at 69%, intra-Asia trade at 59%, and NAFTA at 55%. In 2017, at the mating edition of the Osasu Show Symposium themed The New Economy and Its Impact on Less Privileged Citizens, I spoke about the need for the Nigerian government to rapidly digitize its economy in order for the average citizen to stand a chance at contributing to the collective wealth of the nation while harnessing their innovator potentials. While these discussions led to policy changes at the state level, I was perplexed to find out little to no attempt was made at the national level to increase budgetary provisions for the Ministry of Science and Technology, whose mandate would be to support innovators in devising mechanisms that would transition the nation seamlessly to the global new economy. Professor Kinsley Morgalu, the first keynote speaker of the symposium, also shared thoughts on the difficulties that lies ahead of the continent as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and what it means for us in the light of the symposium theme. I'm very pleased to be with you and I think the topic uh, of this edition is very timely considering the coronavirus pandemic and its huge implications uh, for the whole world and for Africa in particular we're going to be going into a very different world after the coronavirus uh, epidemic. Um, in the context of the theme, um, I am going to be speaking about human capital development and how we can harness the potential of Africa's youth uh, population. And permit me to say a few words about that. Now, in the world in which we are, rethinking Africa means that we have to Take a second look at Africa's possibilities in the world today, especially the world as it's going to be shaped after the COVID crisis. This requires us to rethink the continent's future. Uh, and first of all, we have to recognize that we have to consciously own and shape our continent's future. Now, Africa faces two um, realities today. One is the reality of poverty that a lot, too many people in the continent remain poor. This is a fact. That's number one. So we need a new way of thinking about creating wealth. What is the approach we're taking to development? I believe that we should take an approach to development that is as follows. One, we need to understand that development is a holistic concept. It involves three different things. One, human capital development. That is to say the quality of the lives of our populations. Do we have portable drinking water? Do we have basic health care, especially in today's world of the COVID crisis? We've found that our health infrastructure needs to be improved, even though African governments have responded as best they can. The second aspect is economic growth. We focus too much on this aspect and we ignore the first aspect. We talk a lot about our GDP growth, which is the overall uh, combination of our production uh, of every national economy in a given year of goods and services. So because we focus too much on GDP growth, we do not pay attention to human development. So this is a second dimension of development. The third dimension of development is structural economic transformation. That is to say that the structure of our economies needs to change. We need to become productive economies. We need to become innovative economies. We need to become manufacturing economies. We need to be able to export products, goods and services across the African continent, amongst our African countries and beyond Africa into the rest of the world. So that's briefly dealing with the first reality. The second reality that we face in our continent is the reality of population growth. Africa today is a continent of 1.3 billion people. About 60% of that population is below the age of 25. So we have a youth bulge in Africa, and this trend will continue. Today, the median age in Africa is about 19. By the time we get to about 2046, it could rise to about 25 as the median age. What does this mean? 
It means that as we plan the future, as we own our future, as we redesign the African future, it is basically a future that will be dominated by young people. We don't want a population bulge in Africa where you have hundreds of millions of young people who do not have the right skills and the right education to be productive. Because when you do that, when you allow such a situation to occur, then you're setting your country or your continent up for social and political instability. More Galu in his remarks also profiled investment in education and skills particularly amongst African youth as a solution to ameliorating the challenges in the continent. He stressed the need to invest in an educational system that encompasses entrepreneurship, vocational aptitude, digital innovation, science and technology. We need to invest in education. We need to invest in skills for Africa's youth. We need to invest in an educational system that changes the way we learn, that reforms the curriculum more towards entrepreneurship, more towards you know, uh, vocational skills, more towards innovation, so that our young people can have practical skills when they come out of um, educational institutions. So we need to redesign our curriculum to about 60 to 70 percent science, technology and entrepreneurship and 30 to 40 percent other things. Uh, this is what I think we need to do in order to equip our youth in Africa to be able to take their destiny in their hands in the world after, after the COVID crisis. This is in line with the thoughts shared by the convener of the symposium, Mr. Sasui Gbinidion, on the need for leaders across Africa to prioritize technological advancement. Across Africa, leaders have played lip service to technological advancement. Therefore, our journey from poverty to its prosperity is stunted by lack of African tailored technological innovations, crippling national debt, loss of sovereignty over strategic and critical resources to global superpowers, but perhaps most significantly, by uninspired leadership. The year 2020 is a defining year in the shifting of global, social, political, technological, and economic order. The post-COVID new normal creates both opportunities and challenges for nation states that disrupt entire industries and national competitive advantages. When we think of the world's biggest and fastest growing industries, we think of clean energy, technology, manufacturing. But how many of these industries can survive without Africa's resources? For Africa, this is a time to leverage our immense human and natural resources to its positioning our continent as the new investment destination of choice for the global economy. The world cannot advance technology without Africa's coltane used to build microchips and cobalt used to make lithium ion batteries that store power for mobile phones, tablets, electric cars, and even space rockets. These examples are just scratching the surface of the global dependence on Africa. We therefore have the opportunity and the potential to force developed nations to invest in value creation on the African continent. Rather than selling our resources as commodities, we can become valuable and strategic partners to these foreign nations that depend on us for the advancement of their own economies. In an age of unprecedented investments in digital economies, artificial intelligence and automation as key drivers for sustainable economic growth, Africa must wake up. We must recognize that the challenge before us today is to leapfrog to the global new economy. We must use what we have to become self-sufficient. We need to commit ourselves to investment in human capital development as this is the most important and critical resource of any nation and any continent. We must rededicate ourselves to the principles of democracy in electing leaders with vision, leaders with capacity that will uplift our trajectory. Finally, we must truly respect the rule of law in order to give confidence to ourselves as Africans and our investors. I, 
believe in a reimagined Africa, where African leaders, captains of industries, and everyday patriots like you and I are recognized and respected locally and internationally, despite the challenges we confront. Today's symposium is a timely reminder to us all that Africa is of age and the time is now. We must break out of our stereotypes and define a new age of good governance and prosperity for all people. I've said enough, so I wish us all a fruitful deliberation ahead. May God bless the United Nations of Africa. African countries need to invest a lot more or create investments in venture capital so that venture capital can come into our continent and invest in new businesses. So after we have trained young people in technical and vocational skills and technology and entrepreneurship, they need to be able to set up new businesses uh, with capital that is equity capital, not credit. There's too much credit in African countries, but not enough um, you know, ownership, equity, capital. And this is what our young people need. But this is a far better way to make progress than just giving people credit. Um, because, you know, getting credit in Africa is not easy. There's too many requirements for collateral and many young people cannot meet these requirements. So equity capital in which they invest in venture capital funds and these young men and women co-own the businesses that they will be starting with the skills they have obtained from different types of educational systems. That's the way to go. So this is my view. This is my vision. We need to focus on tackling poverty in a structural manner. We need to focus on economic growth that is inclusive. We need to focus on structural economic transformation. That's part one. Part two, we need to deal with our youth board. Is our huge burgeoning population an opportunity or is it a problem? We can turn it into a population if we invest in our youth uh, in the way we should by reforming our educational system, by giving them the skills and by giving them the capital to start new businesses. So that's my, um, my brief keynote opening remarks. Um, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you, uh, and I hope that this conference will have the kind of outcomes that we can actually put into action for progress in our different African countries, whether it's in, in West Africa, in Central Africa, in East Africa, or in Southern Africa. Welcome back. If you're thinking of ways to get involved in this conversation about rethinking Africa, which helps to shape perspective, helps to shape policies and laws by African legislators and executive members, you can visit our website www.tostvnetwork.com for laws and social media at The Osasa Show to join this conversation. Right now, we'll be showing the fourth episode of our segment, which highlights the sacrifices our military men and women make every single day to keep us safe across this nation, Nigeria. Labor of Our Heroes is brought to you by Defense Headquarters here in Nigeria in collaboration with TOS TV Network. Take a look. Wanton destruction of lives and property, following the crisis which started as a minor incident at Duseuku in Jos Metropolis on the 17th of January 2010, went beyond the containment capacity of the Nigeria Police Force before the military was requested to assist with the deployment of Operation Mesa troops from the Nigerian Army's 3rd Armored Division. On the 19th of January 2010, the violence further spread to other areas such as Bukuru, Riyom, Barakinladi, just north and south local government areas. 
The unprecedented scale of killings and arson necessitated the large reinforcement from the Nigerian army formations and units outside Jos. Consequently, the Nigeria police formally handed over the operation to the military on the 21st of January 2010. The mobilized force was later designated as Special Task Force SDF under the Defense Headquarters. Additional personnel from the Nigerian Navy, the Nigerian Air Force, the Nigeria Police Force, the Department of State Services, the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps, and lastly, the Nigeria Prison Service were also drafted to join as part of a joint operation. The nomenclature of the operation was redesignated Operation Safe Haven on the 18th of August 2015. With the increase in the number of attacks by Boko Haram terrorists in 2012 in Bochi State, where the terrorists attacked Staffa Balewa and Bogoro local government areas, Defense Headquarters established presence in the two local government areas. Also, due to the frequent clashes between farmers and headsmen in the southern part of Kaduna State, in April 2017, five local government areas of the state namely Jama, Kaura, Sanga, Zangon Kataf, and Kauru were added to Operation Safe Haven's area of operation. In line with its mandate, Operation Safe Haven has recorded appreciable successes which have significantly reduced the crime rates by denying criminal elements freedom of action within the joint operation area. These include conduct of offensive operations such as raid operations, cordon and search, and sting operations at all identified flashpoints and black spots, leading to arrest of kingpins, cultists, and the recovery of large cache of arms, ammunition and equipment, as well as mopping up of illicit drugs and substances within the operation's safe haven area of influence. Establishment of additional military outposts within communities and hinterlands to enhance Operation Safe Haven's capacity to effectively dominate the hinterlands and maintain constant presence within the communities. Firstly, we became more aggressive and robust. Uh, we began to deploy in the hinterlands uh, closer to vulnerable areas, uh, you know, to reduce our response time to attacks on those communities. Um, we adopted a very strong mediation uh, strategy. Uh, most conflicts that hitherto will have uh, escalated, uh, we had to mediate, mediate between headers and uh, farmers to, to dial tension and to settle the challenges or the crisis amicably. Uh, we usually hold stakeholders meeting and to a large extent uh, we recorded some good level of peace. Uh, we have adopted, uh, like I said, robust and strategic uh, postures uh, and on most of our highways they are quite safer. For instance, the Riyom, uh, Sanga, Kwanga Road, we've deployed at places uh, that were hit at to flashpoints and, uh, you know, kidnappers then. Commuters travel even up to late in the night without uh, any security challenge. We've recovered, recovered arms and ammunition. We've arrested and neutralized some notorious armed robbers and kidnappers. Uh, we've also recovered uh, large quantities of illicit drugs in conjunction with the NDLE. Uh, and uh, I can say that uh, our joint operational area is quite safe, relatively safe, uh, uh, you know, and uh, We've also been able to add the Nigerian Immigration Service to, to the operation. We, we didn't have them before. So uh, sometime last month in June, uh, the CDS approved and uh, we got uh, some personnel from the Nigerian Immigration Service. And uh, that will go a long way in handling issues uh, pertaining to foreigners and aliens, which we didn't have. And we deal with some of them sometimes in the course of our operations. Please support our troops. Join the conversation on social media with the hashtag Our Military is Capable. Together we shall win this war.
That's it for today's episode. Do follow us on social media at The Osasu Show, at TOS TV Network, at The Osasu Show Foundation, and at Osasu Igmanadian on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you're wondering how do I get involved in Rethinking Africa, how do I get involved with TOS TV Network, you can visit our website www.tostvnetwork.com. I'll see you same time, same place next week. Until then, take very good care of yourself. God bless you.